The United States and the former Soviet Union never used their military strength directly against each other. But that didn't stop them from competing in other ways. What do people at your school compete over? Competing for grades, it's like there's a lot of stress to perform well and like perform to the same standard or above the standard of your classmates. People compete in my school for grades um, and for getting, you know, being faster on the track team, throwing farther, stuff like that. Competition is kind of like, makes me feel good about myself if I do good, or if I do bad, it makes you try harder. The fun of having the challenge of having someone to, something to strive for. And when we play against a rival, it's, it's like no other game. I mean, you go out and you leave everything out on the field. I just love the heat of, like, feel, being under pressure. I love, like, having to win. Definitely the goal, like, just knowing that you could, like, succeed and do well and, like, just to prove it to yourself that you could do things. The space age began with the launch of Sputnik. The former Soviet Union launched this satellite in 1957. It was the first satellite built to orbit the Earth. Sputnik also set off a frantic space race between the United States and the former Soviet Union, the world's two superpowers. How did the U.S. and the former Soviet Union compete in the space race? In 1962, John Glenn became the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. But just one year later, the former Soviet Union boasted the first woman astronaut, or cosmonaut, to fly in space. It was a launch as much about politics as it was about science. Many highly qualified female doctors and engineers in the space program were passed over by the Soviet government. The Soviets wanted a woman who was an ordinary Russian girl, a worker with a common background, to represent communist ideals. Her flight would show the world that one need only be a good citizen to go into space. When the time came to select the woman to go into space, no one was surprised that the 24-year-old Valentina Tereshkova was a worker from a farming family. Tereshkova seemed the perfect choice, not just for the flight, but for the public role she would take on afterwards. Her flight was launched on June 16, 1963. I've begun my duties. All of the systems are working perfectly. I feel excellent. Tereshkova was a heroine to her people. But to the Soviet government, Tereshkova was an example of the country's power. Because of this, Tereshkova had to conceal many difficulties that came with her flight. Her weaknesses could be seen as her country's weaknesses. She became nauseated and was unable to eat during the three-day flight. Space sickness is common, but Tereshkova knew that it would reflect badly on her country if her illness was known. She said nothing about it. When she returned to Earth, she concealed what she had done by giving the space food away to peasants. That's not all Tereshkova concealed. When the landing craft returned, the inner glass plate of the window was cracked. This was a serious failure because if the glass broke, she would die. Eventually, we learned that she cracked the window with the camera. It was a critical question of spacecraft design, and the cosmonaut concealed the truth. She so wanted to be liked. 
Female cosmonauts remained in training, but they were not assigned flights. Why would the former Soviet Union choose to train women if they were not allowed to fly into space? The women were used as propaganda, examples of Soviet power. Though the competition to explore space made diplomatic relations between the United States and the former Soviet Union difficult for more than 40 years, these long-time enemies have put the past behind them to focus on science. Since the Cold War ended in 1991, the United States and Russia, part of the former Soviet Union, have cooperated in a joint exploration of space.